Joining us now is David Bunsen. He is the founder and managing partner of the Bunsen Group, a $4 billion wealth management firm. He's also the author of There's No Free Lunch, 250 Economic Truths and the offer of Dividend Cafe. It's also a a podcast series through National Review, and it's called No Free Lunch. David tweets at David Bonson, B-A-H-N-S-E-N, and he joins us now. Welcome back, David. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Well, there's no free lunch, as you always tell us, and about the economic truths. But tell me, what's the truth on the economy with the, with the UAW strike? It's now in what, day six? Um, I don't think it's at day six yet. It's getting there. It will be by this weekend, and it looks like it'll be expanding this weekend and, uh, you know, extending out to, to additional striking employees, additional picket lines, additional locations. You know, the economic impact is an interesting question because it's kind of an unknown. I mean, the market hasn't moved from it. Even the stocks of the companies in question haven't really moved yet. But there's no question that should this be prolonged, at least on a regional basis, I think there will end up being economic impact to Michigan. When you look at the strikes and, of course, um what President Biden has said in the past, which is that he is the most pro-union president that the United States has ever had. Um, He is faced with what's been called the summer of strikes, whether it's obviously the writer's strikes and what's happening in Hollywood, but also the strikes that have been averted. I'm thinking about UPS, for example, and other um, labor organizations. This, of course, being a historic one because it's the big three and it's all at once. Um, President Biden doesn't really have a great deal of legal authority to truly steer the talks. And so Sean Fain, who is the UAW president as well, I mean, he has not endorsed President Biden. It's not like a requirement that he must do so. But there is some tension there in terms of whether they want to even involve the administration. It's really between the UAW at this point and these automakers. Can anything be done in terms of what the president can do or members of Congress to try to facilitate any of this? Well, you know what, Lauren, I have really strong philosophical opinions about this, and it's not really partisan. Um, I would feel the same way with the Republican in the White House. And it isn't actually connected to what my feelings may or may not be about the dispute itself between labor and management, which is kind of the heart of the matter and a whole separate issue that all sorts of reasonable people can have varying opinions on. But philosophically, I don't understand why we believe it's any of the government's business, what the private negotiations are between any management team and any labor team. I think the president of the United States has every right to hope that things are resolved, to not want to see economic damage, but to put their thumb on the scale one way or the other, and even to use the bully pulpit to sort of imply that one side has a more righteous cause than the other, I think, and again, this isn't partisan, because I would say the exact same thing if any Republican president were doing it, but I think it's appalling. I don't I, I don't think it's helpful. And even Sean Fain, I think what he was trying to do is say, you're just going to complicate this. You're just going to make it more political. Try, please stay out. Let us resolve this. And so, no, I don't think that the president deserves blame for this strike, and I don't think he deserves credit if it gets resolved. I really think this is a non-governmental concern. I think, and I and I, I hear you, and it's, it's point well taken about what um, and what the UAW would like to happen, and of course, of course, the auto manufacturers as well. I think many people think back to what probably forty two years ago now, um, since former President Reagan fired the more than eleven thousand striking air traffic controllers. Now that was. A different they circumstance. Were and, and, yeah, they're federal employees. So people, I think, think to themselves, well, hold on. I remember when a president got himself involved in a strike, but that was a distinction for the reasons you're talking about. He had the authority to do just that. Um, and th- that there was some power that he was able to retain because, as you mentioned, they were federal employees. Um, those who had not crossed the picket line, of course, and that, that had a big impact on our labor movement. This is different. These are not federal employees um, and the air traffic controller strike far more complex than a, a, a two second recitation of the facts here. But when it comes to what the government can be doing not to insert itself in negotiations, but what they ought to be looking at now with the economic implications of the strike where is their role there? 
Well, I mean, anything happening in the labor market, anything happening with wages, with production of goods and services, it all feeds various economic inputs that matter to the overall economy. And so them analyzing it and, and looking at what could or couldn't happen seems seems to be a totally different category. I, I think, generally speaking, strikes come to an end. And at some point, there's going to be a higher cost to management out of it. Where where the federal government is involved here is not in the negotiation between management and labor, but it is very candidly in one of the reasons that labor is wanting a different deal, which is the EV push. That is federally um, uh, uh, sponsored. And the laborers, uh, AFL-CIO has dealt with this before, but right now we're talking about UAW, they are they are smart in that they know there will be an impact to them. Um, many of the electric vehicle manufacturing initiatives have gone to right to work states, and it is much less labor intensive than combustion engine manufacturing, and so therefore it requires less laborers doing less labor, and that's really a big part of this. And so, look, I candidly I think that. Um, a uh, 40% pay increase with a 32 hour work week with overtime above 32 hours and and the issue about not tiering uh, which is really saying that people with more experience shouldn't be paid more than people with less experience i i'm on management side of those issues personally but i'm not a stakeholder in this debate and so i re- it's really none of my business and and i hope they work it all out and everyone is happy i'm very pro worker i want a better deal here but I don't think that the government is able to to uh, get involved much other than in the sense where I think that the electric vehicle push is a factor. And um, I think that there is leverage there for the laborers to say, look, we, we face declining opportunity because of some of the way the hockey puck is moving. Let's talk about what Secretary Janet Yellen um, has had to say and the economy more broadly, taking a step back here because she has been trying to tackle this disconnect on the Biden polling and the U.S. economy. And she has said the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has said that negative polling on Americans perception of the economy reflects um, how is the economy more broadly doing in light of recent improvements? And uh, there are pr- apparently approximately three in five respondents to a Wall Street Journal poll of voters that disapproved of how Biden has handled the economy. And she is saying that there is a disconnect between the actual performance of the U.S. economy and how Americans feel about the way it's been handled. Um, when you see the morning Joe about this. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what's your take on that and that disconnect? Well, I, I don't think that there's such thing as a, a disconnect for any president, any White House, um, because, you know, I hate this analogy because it's so crude, but I think it was Judge Potter who had the famous line about, um, I know pornography when I see it. And and the economy <laughs> is not one of those things that um, we need to be told in a data point, right? Like generally speaking, appetites, um, animal spirits, uh, the level of productivity, the level of growth, a rising of real wages. And what does that mean? It's quality of life. That's the only metric that matters politically is real wages. They don't need to be told in a spreadsheet what the inflation rate is. They don't need to be told in a spreadsheet what gross incomes are. They know if they're doing better after I have my money come in and my money go out, am I better or worse than I was? And that is really um, the way most people that make under $150,000 a year think of economic well-being. Other people that are more asset rich, you know, we can look at the stock market and real estate and other things like that. That doesn't win or lose elections in the same way that real wages do. So I I understand the challenges, but I want to point out the first election I was old enough to vote in was when George H.W. Bush lost to Bill Clinton. And that economy was atrocious in 1990, the savings and loan crisis and other things that were going on. And it had started to get better throughout 91, and it was substantially better in 1992. It really was, but it didn't matter. Voters still felt 
the kind of impact they had gone through in the mid '90s, which was a pretty you know, a pretty difficult recession nationally. Th- this is kind of the issue the Biden administration has: is you can't market your way into people feeling a better economy. Real wages did go down; they are still down since he took office. Certain things are getting better, but people just don't usually grade on a curve that way. And so it's a difficult campaign issue. It's an important point. I mean, it's I often say if perception is king, feeling is the queen. And so, mm-hmm. you know, you, you have some impacts of, of what that actually looks like in marketing. I want to tell you how you should feel about something. Um, it doesn't seem to be successful really with either party, but particularly with with the polling and the disconnect that the Treasury Secretary is further illuminating. It is full and full on display at this point in time. Really important to have your perspective. Thanks for helping us work through and understand the issues in particular. David Bonson, everyone.